birthdays, holidays, promotions, getting that last sprinkled donut. There's a lot in this world we're celebrating, but nothing is worth celebrating more than knowledge, especially knowledge that'll pay off, like understanding how compound interest works, learning how to check your investment professional's background, or figuring out your risk tolerance, or finally understanding all those terms your friends keep throwing around like ETF, ESG, and ICO. Learn about these investment products and more at Investor.gov, your unbiased resource for valuable investment information, tools, and tips before you invest, Investor.gov. Hey, stackers, today's a very special day for us. If you're new to the show, we're doing something brand new today, which means we're not great at it yet, but it is a fun episode. And hopefully we're going to do this every Friday. We recorded this live on a brand new platform that's not public yet called Fireside. If you're one of the few people that was able to navigate Fireside and get there, well, you'll hear that we only had a couple stackers with us, which is cool because we were able to get them both on the stage for our trivia challenge. We had a few more actually, now that I think about it, but we had two that raised their hand. By the way, you don't have to raise your hand and you don't have to be on stage, but if you're in the middle of hearing what we're talking about and you want to give your own take, we're also going to be doing that on our Friday show. So here it is, our debut on Fireside, our first live round table. By the way, we record these on Monday, 5 p.m. Eastern. If you, for now, are in the Basement Facebook group or you follow me on Twitter or you get our stacker emails you'll get the link until it's public, but it's going public here in the next few weeks and you'll be able to get there a little easier. But here we go. Uh, live from the Fireside app. Welcome to a Live Stacking Benjamin Show. Created live on Fireside. Hey, Diana, how are you? Good to see you. Hey, I'm just here to return Doug's record. He is... Well, actually, what's funny is I don't know where the hell he is. Um, and out of, out of curiosity, by the way, because we are a little late starting the show, you ever you ever uh, kind of uh, emceed a podcast before? Well, this sounds like me doing Doug's homework for him back in high school. If Doug can do it, how hard can it be? Sure, I'll give it a try. Awesome. Well, let's roll it, Steve. <laughs> Here we go. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's cousin Diana, and have you ever seen the movie 10 Things I Hate About You? That Heath Ledger, dreamy. Well, today we're talking 10 Things I Hate About You investing style. What are the things you hate most about investing? Here to join the roundtable to talk about what made their most hated list, back with us, we welcome financial coach Sharita Humphrey. And from the Afford Anything podcast, it's Paula Pan. And last, from LenPenzo.com, it's Jimmy Fallon. Nah, he's busy preparing for his own live show. So joining us live today, it's just Len Penzo. Later, we magnify a lucky stacker's money who posted a question to the Basement Facebook group, and I'll one-up Doug as per usual and give you the best trivia you've ever heard. And now, a guy who hates a lot more than 10 things about investing, Joe Saul Sihai. Hey, stackers. Welcome to our first ever live show on Fireside. I am Joe Saul Sihai, average show money on Twitter, and Diana... Welcome team. That was nice. And can we get through that live? How about that? Well, look at that. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're alive to live another day and it's going to be fun. And as you said, we've got a great team with us and we're going to announce our special guest last, but let's say hello to some of our regular contributors here on the show. First of all, deep under Los Angeles, the guy whose uh, internet and microphone barely works that deep underground. It's Mr. Len Penzo. You know what? I'm disappointed because I thought Jimmy Fallon was going to be on today. I was so disappointed. But no, we had to boot him for you, though, man. Come on. Hey, that is clout. That is clout. I'm, I'm on. 
How are you, Len? So, so uh, we may or may not have a story later about uh, your technology skills, your technological savvy. <laughs> Yeah, the electrical engineer with with crap technology skills. It, it is it is it, the story writes itself, doesn't it? Well, it's fantastic because we have another contributor here, Len, who is neither an engineer uh, nor someone that we really consider to be tech savvy. But she's a whiz when compared to you, apparently. Paula Pam from Afford Anything's here. What can I say? I I ride on the. <laughs> The luxury of being a millennial. I, I swear, if you want something done right, ask uh, ask somebody, Paul, about half your age and we're good. I know. Seriously, millennials are old now. Now it's Gen Z. Is that weird to you? I mean, it was inevitable because I, I'm, I'm old enough to remember when I was such a little kid that Gen Xers were like cool you know, like they <laughs> Wait, were. Wait, hold on. Wait a minute. <laughs> I'm standing right here, Paula. Yeah, me too, Paula. <laughs> I, re- I remember when you used to be cool. <laughs> that, that is so uncool. And the woman joining us to make this show cool, how's that for a transition? She is a nationally recognized award-winning finance expert. She's a money mentor. She is back to save the show for a second time. Sharita Humphrey's back. How are you, Sharita? Hey, guys. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. I was like Lynn. I thought Jay Leno was going to, I mean, I was hoping Jay Leno or someone was going to be here. But hey, y'all got, y'all called me, so I'm excited to be here. It is we'd have you over Jay Leno any day, Sharita. Come on. Well, tell everybody a little bit about your coaching practice because you you are somebody, and tell me if this is true, you were somebody who was, you at one point were broke and homeless? Oh, yes. Um, lost everything, but didn't lose hope. That's my message. Lost everything, didn't lose hope. And so now I help women entrepreneurs better understand their money, um, manage it, but increase their cash flow. So that is what I've been doing. I actually was homeless, like you mentioned, Joe, and um, I was able to get myself back on a good financial footing and secured what I thought was going to be my bucket list job was working for the government. And so I was able to do that. I was number 150 out of 150 interviews. Wow. And... (laughs) And I started on April Fool's Day, so I thought it was a joke when they called me and told me April 1st. Um, But loved working with the government. It was amazing to be able to secure what I thought was my bucket list job. But then I decided what my mom said. I was always been a rebel, but I I say I'm a trailblazer. Um, Decided to leave my bucket list job and start my own financial coaching and what would eventually become a consulting firm. I've had an amazing journey and I'm happy to say to you guys, I can share it with your audience. I secured my first government contract this year. So oh, wow. Right back, to doing the work, <laughs> right back to doing the work that I, what I thought I was going to do, you know, that I was always on my bucket list job. So excited to be able to continue to be able to work with the government, but, but now for them to be able to contract my company to teach financial education, um, business financial literacy, and much, much more. So I'm super, super, super excited about the opportunity. And this will actually be my second contract because I, I'm submitting a bid at 6 p.m. Central Standard Time um, to work with the state um, that I live in. So excited to continue to be able to do the work that I love and to be able to impact people and give them hope that just because you lose everything does not mean that you can't rebound and inspire and impact someone else. Well, I'll tell you what, you're an inspiration to so many people. We follow you online, love following you online and all of just the positive messages and the great stuff you're able to help people with. We're super excited that you're here with us to talk investing today. We've got Sharita here. We've got Paula here. We've got Len here. We're going to talk about 10 things we hate about you investing style. But first, this is a metaphor for your business's journey. Sometimes it feels like the world is throwing everything it has at you. And to succeed, you need someone to guide you through. That's what Dell Technologies advisors do. They have the tech advice to help you navigate whatever challenges you're up against and get you safely to where you want to be. For advice on solutions like XPS 13 laptops powered by Intel Evo platform, call an advisor today at 877-ASK-DELL. All right, guys, let's get into this. (laughs) 
All right, give us about 15 shows and I'll figure out how to work my uh, work my stuff here live. But as I mentioned, we got this great piece. It comes from a blog called moneybites.com. And uh, Kate Crowhurst wrote this, 10 things I hate about you investing. By the way, if you're in our live audience and you've got a take after our trivia segment, we'd love to hear your take. So just let us know. But also, if you want to take part in our trivia segment uh, to be joined with one of these three contributors, also let us know that. But let's get into this. 10 things I hate about you investing. Sharita, we'll start with you. Number one on this list is I hate that you don't guarantee returns. And whenever somebody's a brand new investor, that's the first thing they hate, right? You're telling me I got to put my money in this thing and I might lose some money. That sounds scary. Definitely sounds scary. Um, that would have been very scary to me years ago, especially coming from a background where I was homeless. But yeah, I, that's definitely one thing that I hate. I I like guarantee returns, believe in sleep money. So yeah, that's definitely one thing that I, I can say that I hate about investing. Very great investment tool. But yeah, I just don't like those can't get those guaranteed returns. But if we turn that negative into a positive, right? How do we make that a positive that maybe the guaranteed returns are not really your best friend that you think it is? I think one of the ways that you can you can really look at this is because consider something like this article mentioned, something low risk, um, not to just jump all out there. You don't have to be an investment rebel. Um, you can really ease your way into investing and make it your own, but always do it with a lot of education first. And to seek guidance if you're not really sure, I think that could be a really positive way because you may figure out that you can take on more risk than you really know, but you're scared because you don't really, it's unfamiliar territory, especially if you're a new investor. Len, I think you, you've been an investor for a long, long time. And when you look at guaranteed returns, I think you probably look at this the opposite way, don't you? That a guarantee isn't really what you want as a seasoned investor. Well, you know, if you want guaranteed returns, for example, maybe a bond or something, but low risk, low return, right? So that in exchange for that guarantee of something fairly decent, you know, you're probably going to get a much lower return. So yes, there's no guarantees in life, higher risk, higher return, but there is always that risk that that high return will bust and you'll go to zero. Yep. So you just have to be careful. Well, and Sharita talked about education, right? How did you make yourself educated when you first went away from guaranteed returns into the financial markets? Well, lots of reading. You know, you do <laughs> what can you, you do as much research as you can on the companies. You try to learn as much as you can about the companies, and and you you learn about various things that what makes a stock a good pick. For example, and I'll just take it at a top level. For example, something very simple is a, a price to earnings ratio. Maybe you know you get you can get an idea of whether a, a stock is overpriced by its by its P.E. ratio. And you can look at the historical values of P.E. ratios over time, and then you can kind of compare that. Now, that number, the P.E. ratios have drifted up over the years, but still somewhere, you know, depending on who you talk to, that number used to be 14. Now people are saying a P.E. ratio of, say, 21, 22, 23 is really you know, fair game still. So you just kind of have to do lots of research, have to do lots of reading, and it takes time. It, you're, you're not going to learn overnight. It's a gradual process, and you just have to get your feet in there and start learning. Is that the, is, is that the best message there, Paula, that we are not going to learn every, everything overnight and maybe we shouldn't be trying to? Oh, absolutely. It's a slow, gradual process. You, you, people who spend their lives becoming investment experts – um, they're learning things 40 years into their career, partially because the body of knowledge is um, so vast and partially because the world keeps changing. And so the knowledge that you think you have needs to co continually update as circumstances change. And so I, I think that the understanding that all newbie investors should adopt or should accept is that Becoming an investor is a lifetime commitment to skill development. There's never a point at which you're done. There's never a point at which it's, you know, you can like, it's behind you. Investing is a lifetime practice. Yeah. And that brings us, by the way, to a point two on this list of things that this author hates. And Paul, we'll stick with you. I hate that you encourage action without education. I think, frankly, what they're talking about is some of the apps out there. You know, we talk about Robin Hood a lot lately, but that encourage you, hey, just jump in without being educated. Do you hate that too? Yes, I think both extremes are toxic. Action without education is certainly a terrible idea. Conversely, 
analysis paralysis, over-educating yourself at the expense of taking action is equally bad. There, you know, the, the balance is somewhere in that middle. You, you learn enough that you can get started from a reasonable starting point, but also you have the understanding that you will update your mental models and your systems and your understanding along the way. I feel like, Sharita, at, at some point, especially when you were homeless, I mean, you had to take action without some education, right? You just had to move. Yes, but I just to piggyback off of what Paula just mentioned. Yes, I did have to do that, you know, because my back was against the wall. Yeah. Education was everything. It was the thing that really got me back into a good place because I didn't we didn't have conversations about financial wellness and investing, um, just financial literacy in general or money management in my home and not to take away from my parents. You can't teach what you don't know. I don't blame them, but I think a lot of it and the things that I could have probably avoided came from a lot of education, but also not doing anything, just sitting there and what I was doing would have definitely caused continued paralysis. So I think for me, education to get out of the situation that I was in was the root to my transformation, but it also took some action behind it because just what she said, too much education is, is and not putting any yep. action behind it is not going to move you forward. I was going to ask you that next was, as a coach, practically, how do you get somebody to move? Because I'm sure you see this all the time, Sharita. If I just get a little more information, then I can move. And it becomes a little more and a little more and a little more. And as a coach, you got to see it for what it is. Really, it's procrastination and worry. Yes. It's just what you said. It's a, it's a combination of all of those and especially fear because a lot of people as a coach, they fear the unknown. And sometimes people are scared of success. I've seen this um, and they become their own roadblock. Just because of mindset. Mindset causes a direct connection with um, behaviors. So I definitely do see this. And I see a lot of people are like, I just need to learn this next thing. If I learn this thing, then I'll do it. And then it starts to come into months. And then it turns into a year. And then it's several years. And they're still sitting there waiting. I said, I'm just waiting for that right moment. There was never going to be a right moment. Because guess what? I, I was homeless not one month, two months, or three months. It was close to a year. And I did that with two small kids. They thought they were on an extended vacation. Little did they know. It was those actions that I was putting behind it, learning, implementing, learning, implementing. And I started to be able to see movement. I started to be able to see myself get into a place because a lot of people were surprised when I share that I was, you can still be working and be homeless. Um, And so going back and going back and living in that motel, not in the greatest space, but it gave us somewhere to be able to live. In that one bedroom, I learned so, so much that I knew that every time I stepped out of that door, that I was going to implement something, that I wasn't just going to sit on that information because I saw that so many times around me, not only in my family, but friends um, and just people just seeing them not really be able to get change their dynamics. And for me, education and action went hand in hand. And that's how I was able to transform my life and transform the lives of those who are attached to me because now I've become the trailblazer in my family. I'm the only one who is a full-time entrepreneur. I have people working for me. And it was always like in my family, you work until you die. And they just thought this was a dream. So I had to skip out of my own way to be able to show them that you can build and create the life that you want, but you can't just keep sitting waiting or just over medicating yourself with edu- um, information yeah. and not implementing it. I like that. I like that phrase over, over medicating yourself, but how do you, how do you push your client to get over there? I mean, you've got an inspiring story and you do it, but when you see it in your backyard, what do you do? Do you just hold up the mirror? I mean, what do you, what do you do to get people to move? <laughs> Yes, definitely. Um, I have something, your morning mirrors. So I always tell them, whatever you, whatever you like, look at yourself, put that mirror up because that your, your situation didn't happen just by chance. I always try to give, um, share my story with my clients and people who are listening just because I want them to know that this didn't just happen. I just wasn't lucky. There was a lot of things that I had to do to get here. So really being able to have them to open up, I have like these five little sheet worksheets that I created. And most people are like, oh my gosh, I had so many emotions. You just made me stare myself, you know, right in my face and you were not even in the room. I've done this enough times to Mm. be able to see and know that sometimes is you can talk to people all day. You can share your journeys. You can share what the 
positive outcomes can be. But you know what? Until they sit with their truth and really be able to process it and shift their own mindsets, that's the only way we're going to modify those money behaviors so they can get into a belief system that they can really change the dynamics and the financial trajectory that they're on. Yeah, that's such powerful stuff. I mean, I think about Nike had a slogan back in the 80s before Just Do It for a short time that was feel the fear and do it anyway. And I think that sounds like what you're saying. It's okay to feel the fear, but just you got to push through. Number four on this list, and actually I take that back, number three on this list, Len, I want to go to you because uh, I feel like this this one belongs on the lenpenzo.com blog, big guy, which is number three is I hate that you use as an excuse to spend. And let me define for everybody what we're talking about here. Uh, the author writes, buying shoes that you wear more than once does not make them an investment. Ditto buying something you might use long term like a holiday house. On this subject, a timeshare, this author says, is a terrible investment, but people pitch it as an investment. Len, you talk all the time, I feel like, about people going, well, it's an investment, right? I'm investing in this. How do you parse between what's really an investment and what might just be another pair of shoes? Well, investments are things that you're taking a risk and things that you're not taking a risk on are not investments. For example, a lot of people like to say, including this author here later on down the road, calls a house, buying your house an investment. To me, that is not an investment because the risk, there's no risk there. What you're doing there is you're buying a place to live, right? But an investment is something where generally you're taking a, a chance on something that you think is going is undervalued and is going to gain in value over time. And that's what investing is all really all about is, is – is trying to identify the things that are out there in the world that society has undervalued. And you recognize that, and then you can take advantage of that when the rest of the world catches up to what you have seen. And that's how you make your money. Now, it works in reverse too. I mean, if you over... You can invest. You might you'll call it investing. For example, an overpriced stock. I'm not going to name any stock in particular. Let's just say stock X Y Z. It's had a tremendous run up. Let's say over ten or even two years. And people love to jump into stocks when they've made these huge run ups. Is that a smart investment at that point? Probably not. But you're still taking the risks. So you, it's all about risk. Like I said. So that's the difference. It's like value and risk. And I think that's how I'd sum it up. Yeah. Uh, number four on this list, Paula, is I hate that you make people really emotional. Paula, I know the way that you buy investments when you're buying rental properties, you got to get a little emotional about buying something that's right there in front of you and might be this pretty nice thing. Sure. I mean, I think that it's inevitable that everyone becomes emotional about investments, whether whether it's a piece of real estate, which is visible and, and tangible and visceral, and that generates a lot of emotion in, inherently, or whether it's a stock where you might feel, you know, they, they say fear and greed, but nobody ever sits down and thinks to themselves, I am feeling greedy today. <laughs> well, the way that that greed expresses itself uh, is one, one example of it is FOMO. You see everybody else piling into GameStop or AMC theaters and you get the sense of FOMO, like, why am I the person who's missing out? And so then you buy AMC theaters at the top and it comes crashing down and that's where people so often go wrong. So anytime that, you know, that emotion will be there, but when that emotion causes you to deviate from a written plan that you've set out for yourself, you know, I think that's the the barometer, the gap between the prescribed written plan and your impulse in the moment. That's when you know whether you're making a, a cool, like a, a rationally headed decision versus an emotional one. But I feel like some at some point to follow up, right? People buy, you know, you said AMC, so we'll do that. Or uh, I, I think you said AMC, maybe GameStop. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I said both. Yeah. Right. AMC and GameStop. But you buy it at the top and then it goes down. You know, the other emotion, which is damn it, I should have known better, right? Like you mm -hmm. second guess. It, it, we, I, I feel like we Monday morning quarterback our decisions way too much. Right, exactly. The, that powerful emotion of regret as well. And, and regret is, you know, if you can use it productively, you can take it as a learning experience. And there are two forms of taking it as a learning experience. Either you are 
learning in the sense that you are obtaining new information that you did not previously have, or there's also learning in the sense that you already knew this stuff. You just fail to act on what you already knew. And so it serves as a reminder of something that you maybe knew at a cognitive or intellectual level, but that you hadn't or haven't deeply internalized yet. Hey, Joe, Joe, I, I, let me just step in there real quick, because because what we're talking about there is almost like the difference between investing and speculating, right? Especially with things like AMC and GameStop, right? What's been going on now. And, and the way you can stop yourself so much from turning it into speculating, well, one is do your, do your due diligence, right? But another thing that you should do, and this, this will stop the regret. And I talk about this all the time and I'm not, I mean, this isn't my idea. This is a, a tried and tested, just it's good practice when you're investing is have that exit strategy. When you buy the stock, know when you're going to exit at what price and know both down and up. And if you do that, I think that would really eliminate or at least reduce, greatly reduce any regret you might have on the downside. That's for sure. That's why uh, uh, I like when I buy individual positions, Len, that's why I like having a stop loss is simply because I don't even give myself the emotional ability to back out, right? I mean, I'm going to automatically sell out and then I have to make a different decision under different emotional circumstances. Let me give you one more thing too. You can there's you can have regret on the on the upside too. And I this happened to me with a, one of my speculative plays just for fun. I didn't it's very little money I put into it. But the stock doubled and I didn't take the money off the table. Now it's uh, back to where I bought it at. So <laughs> unfortunately. So but that's okay cuz I, I my my plan all along was to hold it. This is something that I think was going to hit, you know, 5 years down the road anyway. So I never intended on selling it. But still, I mean, I can see people you watch a stock double and then it falls just as quickly and you're like, "Darn, why didn't I, you know, why didn't I sell when I had a chance?" I Take thought, some money. I thought you were saying your plan all along was to have it go up to double and then come back to zero. That just a strategy. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Right. Sharita, I want to loop you back into this because the next one on my list here, number six is I hate that you create investment FOMO. And part of what Len and Paul are talking about is you see these things like GameStop, AMC, you know, some of the cryptos out there, people making all this money. How do you fight that? This fear that everybody else is getting rich, but me. I think that you need to stop looking at what everybody else is doing. Um, but I know the internet and, you know, people around you and family makes it difficult. So I think that you really need to understand and have goals um, that are clear to you and really be able to understand that what works for them may not work for you. And they each and that your financial journey is going to be different. Your uh, where you want to be um, as far as retirement and how your lifestyle is, is going to be totally different. So it will stop that FOMO type of feeling and also the one that everybody likes to use now, YOLO. You only live once, right, so I might as well right. just try it all. Right. <laughs> so <laughs> I think though those are things that stay in your financial lane. I heard that. I, I love that. Stay in your financial lane because that's the lane. It's okay to kind of just get off and just try to check out and see if that's going. some things are going to work for you. But you know what's best for you. And if those certain things are making you feel that way, that's something that's more than just you feel like that you're missing out. It's really trying to figure out, do you, are you trying to compare yourself to someone else's journey or so on or somebody else's financial lane? So for me, I've learned to stay in my financial lane, learn as much as I can, because I'm taking so many notes while I'm listening to you guys. <laughs> but I also know what's work, you know, what's going to work for me. And I'm also interested in looking at what you guys have. But I also want to make sure that my what the financial outcomes that I want for myself and my family is aligned with my goals and, and what I want to accomplish. Hey, Sharita, you know, you're talking about FOMO and, and YOLO. And, you know, when I was growing up, my dad had one of his own called Bromo, which he always <laughs> he always used after a really rough uh, night out on the town. So that, that you know, going with his buddy, so. I think that's a whole different thing, Len. <laughs> <laughs> it might be a might be a whole different show, but I do think that's a good way to leave uh, the first part here. Hey, we're about to transition into our trivia section. So if uh, anybody here in the live audience wants to win some collectible free swag, I'm just going to randomly pick some people. We've got uh, Woody here. We have Jennifer here. We have Susan here. If you guys want to get in on the trivia, just uh, raise your hand, hit your little icon there and uh, request to come on stage and hear in just a second, we're going to we're going to team you up with our three contributors 
for those of you who are new to the show, we've got a year long competition going on between Paula Len and uh, my co-host OG Sharita. You're playing on behalf of OG today. And there's good news and bad news about that. Sharita, do you want the good news or the bad news first? Um, hit me with the bad news. <laughs> the, the bad news is you're winning. Which means that you're going to okay, have great, great. Okay, <laughs> you, you and whoever your teammate is, though, you guys are going to have to guess first. And of course, for anybody that hasn't listened to our show before, you may not know that, uh, well, these these questions are like throwing a dart. Len is in second. He's a returning champion. And Paula, for some reason, is tied for second. She shouldn't be tied for second this early in the season, Paula. I don't know what the heck's going on there, but you you seem to be on a roll right now. Heck yeah, and I'm going to keep it up. Right. Well, I'm not, I don't know if I'm missing anything from the audience because I'm really not sure how to uh, how to do this. Here we go. We're going to pair, uh, we're going to pair Jennifer with, well, let's just say hi to Jennifer. Uh, coming up to the stage, joining us today, it's our new friend, Jennifer. How are you, Jennifer? Hi, Joe. I'm good. How are you? I'm I'm good. I'm glad you could join us for the our first live recording, and it's not as bad a not as bad a train wreck as I thought it was going to be, Jennifer. <laughs> well, I do what I can. <laughs> uh, who would you like to be paired with? Somebody that you've listened to before on the show, <laughs> Leonard Paula, or yes. uh, go first with Sharita. I'm 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 in awe of the celebrity here. Um, so yeah, Len or, or uh, Paula would be great. Okay. Well, we're going to pair you with Paula cause she is officially still in last place. So Paula, <laughs> I'm and, sorry, Paula. <laughs> and then Len, I think is, is returning champion. You're going to be the last person to get some help here. Uh, let's see if we've got, <laughs> you, you know, what, let's get our producer Karen up here. Uh, let's em- embarrass Karen. Come on, Karen. And, uh, Sharita, our producer, Karen is going to be teamed up with you. Okay, good, good. That's good stuff. And here we go. Do we have do we have Karen? I Say, am here. Yes. Producer Karen Rapine, welcome back to the show. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Karen's like, oh no. All right. Uh Karen Sharita. Well, you guys already know each other, so we're good to go there. All right. Diana, you ready for some trivia? Let's do it. Here we go, everybody. Here is today's question. Hey there, Stackers. This is Joe's cousin Diana, and in typical Doug fashion, he's of course nowhere to be found. I'm still surprised we dated back in high school. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. But what can I say? My relationship with Doug is like today's holiday, National Catfish Day. Ever been catfished? Well, I'll share this story, but before I do, let's get you today's trivia question. In 2005, it's believed that the largest catfish on record was caught, a behemoth Mekong giant in a remote village in Thailand near, now this is shocking, the Mekong River. Experts believe that this monster is not only the largest catfish ever, but also the largest freshwater fish ever recorded. So how about this? How big was the catfish? I'll be back with your answer faster than you can go lie to someone about your identity. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> oh, so good. Uh, Sharita, the biggest catfish ever caught. And uh, Karen, uh, this is for both of you guys. So maybe you guys confer amongst yourself. What do you think? Okay. I have one question as a fishing family. Is it, how long it is or how much it weighs? Oh, it is. Uh, it's how much it weighs. Good question. Okay. I say 98 pounds. Well, Sharita is going to have the final word here. Uh, yeah. uh, Sharita, what do you think? Your partner, Karen, is she on it or? You're muted, Sharita. I'm going to go with 600. Sorry, Karen. <laughs> oh, 600. Okay. <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah, so you don't think 98 pounds is nearly enough, Sharita? <laughs> no, not for a record. <laughs> yeah. Like, I don't know. I may be wrong. There we go. All right. Uh, Paula and Jennifer are next. Uh, Jennifer, what do you think? I thought 98 was low. I feel like 600 was high. Um, I probably would land somewhere closer to 350. Paula, what do you think? 
Ooh, it's interesting being the second person to guess. I'm normally the last. And when I guess last, I can just play strategy and decide which person to, to Chelsea Brennan. <sighs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when you had your chance to Chelsea Brennan last time, Paul, you didn't do it. I know I didn't Chelsea Brennan, Chelsea Brennan. <laughs> it's right. <laughs> <sighs> and I lost because of that. Yeah, we both lost because Learn, of that. Learned I, my lesson. All right. So, Jennifer, your guess is 350? That sounds good. All right. Let's go with uh, let's go with that. Let's go with 350. 350, Jennifer and Paula. So, Len, you're in a weird spot guessing last. What do you think? Yeah, that's, this is Len, unique. I, I, well, I don't think I've gone last. Len, you can be paired up with Susan because she's on stage, too. Oh, we do have Susan. Last. Hey, Susan. And she has a nice car. I see her car. It's a beautiful car, Susan. Oh, thank you. Yeah. How are y'all doing? Is this Susan, Susan, from Dallas? Yes. Well, it's about time you got here. Yeah, I know. (laughs) I had to figure this app out. (laughs) Yes. Susan's one of the uh, a stacker that we met when we were at Dallas. That was fun. It was a good, good time. But uh, Susan, what do you think? So we've got uh, Jennifer and Paula at 350, uh, Sharita and Karen at 600. What are you thinking? So my initial gut was like a hundred, but maybe it's more than that, but I don't know if it's 300. So I would go somewhere in between. What do you think, Lynn? Uh, well, I've seen on TV, I've seen some humongous, I've seen pictures of humongous catfish and I, 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 I caught like a 20 pound catfish once, you know, if I could catch a 20 pound catfish, what's the numbers? 350 and what? 350 and uh, Sharita and Karen have 600. Mm. 600. <laughs> so I'm going to Chelsea Brennan either. <laughs> well, I guess well, there's a good spread there. I guess I give it's either it's going to be. It's either it's going to be either below or above Paula at 600. Let's see. I think we have more. Uh, uh, Sharita's at 600. Oh, Sharita's – okay, well, it'll be above or below Sharita. Uh, and I think there's more room above 600 than below f- for us, Susan. So let's go 601. Susan, you on board with that? Really, Lynn? <laughs> <laughs> hey. welcome, welcome to the game, Sharita. One last – all season long. It, I, this is fun. I like going last. <laughs> yeah, Sharita, remember what I said about good news and bad news? This is the bad news piece. I know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Susan, you on board with that one? 601? Sure. Sounds good to me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Uh, Diana, you ready? Do it. Well, I'm ready too, but we uh, we don't tell you yet. We are going to take a break right now. Can I ask Diana a question real quick? Go is, for it. Is, is Doug a good kisser? Um, I'm going to plead the fifth on that one. Oh, okay. <laughs> 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 and, and on that note, we're going to take a little break and we'll be right back. This episode is brought to you by PayPal. Ah, uh, online. It's where PayPal was born. But it's not all dancing cats and double rainbows in cyberspace. I mean, one minute you're trying to outbid Soup Boy 99 on some antique spoons. Next thing, your bank account is nothing but tumbleweeds. But now, PayPal has ventured out into the real world with non-dancing cats and actual rainbows, ready to help you start taking payments in person. It's a safe and easy way to get paid. Just generate your unique QR code in the PayPal app for customers to scan and start accepting PayPal in person today. Learn more at paypal.com slash US slash get QR code. Hi, I'm Emilio. I'm a program manager at Google. Right now, lots of people are looking for ways to learn new job skills. That's why we created Google Career Certificates, an online training program for fast-growing fields like IT support, project management, data analytics, user experience design, and more. You don't need any prior experience, and you can be job ready in about six months. So put your skills to work. Go to grow.google slash certificates. Well, let's review this for everybody before we have Diana back here on stage. Sharita and Karen, you guys are at 600 because Sharita, you just booted Karen's uh, guess at 98 to the curb. 
No, it's all love. <laughs> <laughs> it just seems low. Well, according to all these other guesses, it seems low to me too, because Jennifer, you and Paula at 350, how are you feeling, Jennifer? I don't know how I feel. <laughs> <laughs> She, I want to win. <laughs> she feels like she's wondering why the hell she did this. That's that's how she's feeling. And then uh, Susan, you and Len went the highest at six oh one. You feeling confident? Mm. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I think they should pick again. I think they should pick again. <laughs> I think Sharita's missing the upside right now with that comment. All right, here we go, uh, Diana. Let's get us an answer. Okay, Joe, since I'm taking over this podcast today, maybe a little history. So I was the new kid in high school and lo and behold, some guy named Doug was the first person to introduce himself. I should have known better when this sweaty guy swaggers over to my locker and introduces himself as the captain of the football team. Turns out he's captain of the ball washers for the football team. Yeah, ball washers. He just left out a few of the important words. But Doug is a big talker, and of course, I totally bought it. See my name tag? My name is Diana, and I was catfished by neighbor Doug. So we dated for a whole two days and just know that I've since moved on. But Doug is just too fun to totally ditch. I mean, have you ever ridden in his El Camino? You haven't lived until you listen to Harry Styles on 8-Track. All right, enough about me and Doug. Let's get you today's trivia question. Since we're talking catfish, what is the biggest catfish ever caught? It took over an hour for the Thai fisherman to reel it in because it was nine feet long and weighed an astonishing 646 pounds, which is funny because that was roughly Doug's weight back then too. Now that's a catfish. <laughs> it looks like Len and Susan are our winners. hey oh, Can we get a catfish dinner for that? <laughs> No, but, but I've been catfished. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Sharita feels totally catfished. <laughs> yeah. Totally. Where, where are the cameras and MTV? <laughs> that was a nice job, by the way, kicking your partner Karen to the curb on that one. Cause you were in the right, you, you were in, in, in the right area. Susan, congratulations. You're taking home some collectible stacking Benjamin swag. Well, uh, say thank you to Lynn. <laughs> Follow him. <laughs> hey, I, maybe you can give me a ride in that car, Susan. Next time I'm in the palace. Bring your, bring your helmet. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, ladies, Jennifer and, and Jennifer, you know what? For being brave enough to come up on stage, we're going to send you some swag too. So uh, we're going to have uh, uh, Gertrude reach out to both of you. And because I know we have uh, both of your emails, so we'll reach out to you guys and make sure you get something to take home. Thank you. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks, ladies, for playing. All right, guys. We are now on to the second half of the show. And by the way, if you've got a take on our topic today, which is... 10 things I hate about you investing style. It's time to time to get those in. So if uh, anybody wants to come back up to the stage and talk about things you hate when it comes to investing, happy to take those, but let's continue with this conversation while we wait for our audience who may or may not join us. Number seven on this list, Sharita, I hate that you scare people into sticking with cash, she writes. When the stock market crashes, we feel panic because we risk losing money. That panic scares people into sticking with cash and putting their money into savings account where there's lower risk. The problem there, Sharita, of course, is that when we put money in cash, we're not going to earn any money. How do you how do you get people away from that type of a fear? Um, what I, I would have to say for that is that panic is knowing what you said is the downside is you're not really in making that much. So I have to just kind of just go back to what Lynn said in the beginning. You have to be able to remove that and not get so scared and sticking with that cash because I still have people who say I have I have cash and underneath my mattress, I keep it in the safe. It's about three or four thousand dollars. And I'm like, how are you making money on that? What's the fear? They're like, because what if the banks close? What how will I be able to get money? I'm like, what if the world's ending? I'm like, what are you gonna do with it? Who's gonna <laughs> what are you planning on doing with that cash? Even if if the world is ending, what do you plan on doing? So just kind of throwing those questions back to them to kind of figure out 
where that mindset is, because number seven is definitely a mindset issue because they're trying to figure out what to do if I'm going to lose the money. And so I can say that I have really been able to help my clients kind of just lose that thing of I'm scared. I'm I'm sticking with cash. This is the only way to go. I'm not going to make any investments. So for me, just being able to talk to them to kind of just defer that mindset is one of the things that I always do. But it also, Sharita, I think goes back to what you said before, which was really start with your own goals, right? I mean, if you've got a certain goal, who cares what the stock market does today or tomorrow? It's about that time frame, not about today. Um, you're certainly right, um, Joe. You are certainly right. Stick in your financial lane. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm definitely stealing that. Next on our list here is I hate that you make it seem like current returns will last. Boy, oh boy, Paula, we've seen this, right? Uh, hey, because something was good yesterday, this is going to be the hot thing forever. Exactly, exactly. We see time and time again that if something rises, and I, I think what's happened this year with cryptocurrencies is a perfect example when a particular type of asset rises, like Bitcoin or Ethereum, then all of a sudden people who were never previously interested in it become interested in it. And, and you know, if you become interested in something and that interest leads you to study it, to read about it, to learn more about it, that's great. Where it falls apart is um, like, like we were talking about earlier, the difference between speculating and investing. If you see something go up and so you absentmindedly just start chucking money at it, believing that it's a sure bet, that's where people really come into problems because then you're investing in what you don't understand with the assumption that what goes up will continue to rise. How do you get away from that though? I mean, I'm sitting here thinking over my career when I was a financial planner, Paula. I mean, there were times when people said, well, come on, this is General Electric. General Electric's never going to go down. Look at General Electric today. And you have people that say, hey, this is Microsoft right now, right? What could happen to Microsoft? And yet Microsoft for the longest time that stock went absolutely nowhere, right? Like, how do you get away from falling in love with what worked today? Mm. I think this is where, uh, if you want to go into individual stock picking, you you need to be, this is where data comes in, right? You need to be reading the quarterly reports, the quarterly earnings reports. You need to have a strong understanding of what that company is doing and how it compares to other companies in its field. And if you aren't willing or interested in doing that, that's perfectly fine. If that's the case, then stick with broad market index funds because going into individual stock picking is at least a part-time job. Well, but wait a minute, Paula, let's shake this tree a little bit. Let's okay. have, let's have some fun here. We have uh, we did a story last week about Michael Burry, of course, who was in the the big short. Michael Burry talked about this. Uh, Jack Bogle even commented on this before he passed away. And there was a recent article in The Atlantic about this, which is what happens when index investing becomes so prevalent that it masks the true price of the underlying investments, meaning that what happens when passive investing really doesn't work anymore. And even Jack Bogle said, if so many people continue passive investing, this very likely could become a scenario that is true where passive investing loses its value. But if you're somebody that, and we see people do this, they clang the bell that passive, 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 passive. How do you know when it isn't that it's not working this year or next year? It just doesn't work anymore. I would have two answers to that. One is you don't know, right? The point is that you don't know. The point is that you're a non-expert. And so the best thing that you can do as an individual is to properly asset allocate in a way that's aligned with your goals, your timeline, what that money is going to be used for. And so as that bucket of money gets closer to its date of withdrawal, you start de-risking. So because of the fact that you don't know and that even passive investing, even index fund investing is not guaranteed, what's within your, your locus of control is your asset allocation. What's outside of your locus of control are are the returns that those that various smattering of assets will give you. Um, so that's partially my answer to it. The other part of my answer is that passive investing is the worst idea other than all of the other ones. You know, meaning for all of its shortcomings, any other type of asset class that you might want to go or ty- style of investment that you might want to go into, like individual stock picking or flipping houses or buying rental real estate or investing in crypto, those have even greater volatility and require even greater risk. So 
Is it a perfect idea? No. But is it better than many alternatives? Yes. Uh, Leonard, Sharita, thoughts about that, about falling in love with your investments? Well, let, let me just say this about passive investing. It's, it works fairly, it works pretty good. It's, the history has shown it's worked very good in an up market. It, work, it goes in reverse, though, in a down market. It, for as good as it is in an up market, it does the same. It goes in reverse in a down market, and that's the risk. And how do you know when you're in, in your passive investing is strategy is starting to maybe get long in the tooth? Take a look at the percentage of that particular index, whatever it is that you're investing in, passively and take a look at what percentage of that index or what percentage of the stocks in that index are going up versus the ones that are going down and compare that to the weighted averages within that index. So if the if the highest weighted stocks in that index are going up, for example, the FANGs for you pick an, uh, a, a regular index and the FANGs make up the great weight, the bulk of that, and they're going up, that's great. But if they're making up the great majority of that, uh, maybe it's time to be, you know, kind of take a little more caution anyways into the passive investing. Just be, be a little more cautious about it. So so that's what I'd say. I, you know, it's great. I mean, you can't argue with the results of passive investing over yeah. the last 20 years. You can't. You can't. But, but it's been a bull market for the last 20 years. What happens when we go into a secular bear market? It's going to work in reverse. Just keep that. Well, and I also just uh, wonder, I mean, really people think that because it's worked for the last 20 years, Len, that even without a bear market, just with so many people taking to one type of one way of investing, if that herb mentality doesn't start to work itself out. I'm with you. I don't know that I'd change anything. Also, also, Paul, I don't know that I'd be out there hunting for the perfect active strategy, but um, I do wonder about that. Uh, last thing here, Sharita, and we will end this discussion with you, unless somebody from our uh, live audience sitting here with us on Fireside has uh, something that they want to bring up on any of these topics about things we hate about investing. Uh, number 10, Sharita, is I hate you make it seem like there's a perfect time to invest. Everybody wants the perfect time, Sharita, and it's never, it never seems to be, it either never seems to be like the perfect time or it seems like I always miss it, Sharita. So what do I do? <laughs> Yes, I have to say that there's, I hate that too. There's never a perfect time. You just have to figure out and really educate yourself, like Paula said and Lynn. Just know, take caution, but don't wait. It's like, planning for your, you know, it's a part of your retirement, you know, retirement planning. You don't want to, you want to start as early as you can. So that may, you can maximize the, the, the return on your investment. So I would say there's never going to be a perfect time. There's never a perfect time. Just when they said they just to have kids, there's never a perfect time. You're going to say, well, I'm going to wait until after this happens. I'm going to wait until I have this amount of money in the bank. I'm going to wait until I get, I'm in my career at this time. The time is never going to be perfect. It's just going to be how educated you are, how comfortable you are with your risk tolerance, and really being able to figure out what works best for you. I think that is the perfect note to leave this discussion on. Guys, thanks so much for hanging out with us. Before we say goodbye and hand this over to Diana, let's uh, see what's happening where all of you are at. And we'll have our guest of honor go last. Uh, Len, what's coming up at LenPenzo.com, my friend? Um, well, it was uh, Father's Day a little while ago, and uh, I put on nine important tips that I think uh, every dad should teach his kids. Uh, kind of a, just a, an overall summary that you can share with your children about personal finance. Uh, just come on by and check it out. That is fantastic. What a, did you have a good Father's Day, by the way? I certainly did. Yeah, I didn't uh, have to cook. The honeybee uh, took care of me and uh, had a really nice, relaxing Father's Day, which is how I love it. I was disappointed that um, you didn't come over to my house for Father's Day and make me that awesome lasagna, but whatever, dude. <laughs> <laughs> next time I'm in Texas, it's a, yeah. some fantastic. It was so, it was so, so good. You haven't lived until you've had lens lasagna. Uh, Paula, what's going on at afford anything on the afford anything podcast. We have an interview with Brad Barrett and Jonathan Mendonza, the hosts of the choose FI podcast, which I know many people who listen to this show also listen to choose FI. We get into a, a deep somewhat philosophical conversation about what we learned from the year 2020, how 2020 was a line in the sand, and what we learned about 
the future of work, of money, of career, of what's important in life. Uh, every all of the lessons and and frameworks and mental models that came out of the last four hundred or so days, um, having gone through this pandemic, and so that conversation is on the Afford Anything podcast, which you can download anywhere where the finer podcasts are found. <laughs> Only the finest, the tippy, Only the finest. tippy top. Uh, before we say goodbye to our guest of honor, I want to acknowledge a, a, a person that I'm so happy has uh, helped us out today and is going to be a member of the team here in the future uh, from time to time. Uh, Doug's not going anywhere, unfortunately. Because, Diana, you knock the ball out of the park way, way, way upgraded over my mom's neighbor, Doug. Well, thanks so much. I will be expecting a raise um, for my wonderful <laughs> performance today. I'll think yeah. about it. Thank you very much. I will, I will definitely uh, keep that under advisement. But you're going to say this in a few minutes, but you've got a conference coming up, my friend. Yes, the Economy Conference. It's happening at the University of Cincinnati this November. And it, I mean, it's five months away, but it's going to be here in no time. So planning is well underway. All right. And uh, where did that music come from? Uh, oh, that's me. Sorry, sorry, Joe. I was uh, messing around here with the. <laughs> Let's just give Diana some theme music to say economy too. Uh, but it's economy, economyconference.com. Correct. Yep. Awesome. Sharita Humphrey, I'm so happy you came and saved the show. And thanks for being a part of this historic first time doing this live. We lived through it. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited. This was really good. Um, thanks, Lynn. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think she's I forgiven thought, you, Lynn. <laughs> thought, you know what, Sharita? I'm sorry, but you know what? That, that was my first chance all year to. <laughs> that's okay. That's okay. Yeah, that's okay. You're going to find. I'm glad you won. That's right. Yeah, Lynn, no offense, but I'm sure in the next few days you may find a dead catfish in your mailbox, but no big, no big deal. Like, like the horse head in The Godfather, right? Yeah. <laughs> Sharita, tell us tell us uh, how people can get a hold of you and uh, about your coaching. Okay, I'm definitely can follow me. I'm Sharita M. Humphrey on all social media platforms. You can go over to SharitaMHumphrey.com. You will see me July 14th. I will be putting on a um, global presentation with the U.S. Embassy um, very, very soon. Um, so I'm super excited about that to be able to continue to help um, women entrepreneurs over in South Africa to really help them to um, help to solve world challenges. So super excited about that opportunity. I have a Facebook group. It's called the Money Mindset Movement. So I'm always giving in that group, really being able to help others to create their own path to wealth. So thank you, Joe, again, for having me. This was super, super fun. And I look forward to continuing to support all of you. Thank you so much. Oh, my goodness. It was, it, it's been too long since we had you on last. And I'm so glad you could help us today and definitely check out everything Sharita does because uh, it's amazing. Great advice and very inspirational. And you'll find, by the way, not only all our links for Sharita, but also for Paula, Len and Diana on our show notes page at stackingbenjamins.com. All right, Diana, are you ready to help me finish this thing off? Absolutely. All right, guys, Diana, what should we have learned today? Oh, what should we have learned today? First, take a lesson from our round table. Even though there are things that we don't like about investing, it's still a great opportunity to turn your money into more money. Second, education is key when it comes to investing, but there's a lot to learn. So make sure you don't get stuck in analysis paralysis. But the big lesson neighbor Doug who I know what you're thinking. You probably want me back to host every show now. So Joe, I want 20% more money than Doug's getting. I think you're worth way more than that. Diana. Well, let's go 50% more. Uh, I see what you did there. Okay. All right. And big thanks to Sharita Humphrey for joining us today. She made the show, didn't she? You'll find Sharita at sharitahumphrey.com. For more Paula Pant, just listen to the Afford Anything podcast, which you'll find wherever you're listening to us now. And to see what Len's up to, head over to lenpenzo.com or find the nearest bunker and dial him up on your own shortwave radio. 
I'm Diana Merriam. And if you're wondering what I've been up to since getting over Doug, check out the Economy Conference, which is a party about money coming to Cincinnati on November 13th and 14th. And the wonderful Joe Saul Cihai is one of our speakers. Tickets are available now and you can learn more at economyconference.com. Didn't catch all that? We've got you covered. To learn more about our guests and for more resources, you can head to our show notes page at stackingbenjamins.com. Welcome to the after show. This is the part of the podcast that doesn't exist. If you're here with us, <laughs> Len, nice uh, job. <laughs> if you're here with us now, who told Len there were buttons? <laughs> Wait, there are buttons? Whoa. Oh, no. Oh, no. What happens in the after show, Sharita, s- stays in the after show. So we never talk about it, but we, uh, but we have a lot of fun here. Thanks for making the show, by the way, Sharita. Oh, thank you. This was really fun. Thank you. Well, I got, we, we have to tell you a story because, and we'll tell everybody else the story too. I want to tell the story of, uh, of trying to get this first live show together because we first have Len and Doug come and try out their microphones and, uh, Doug, how long Len, did it take Doug? Maybe 25, 30 minutes. Yeah, it's probably, probably right. Yeah. It, it took Doug a while, but Len, you and I gave up after about an hour and 10 minutes. I think the first, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just so embarrassing. No, uh, so, I'm so, I'm so uh, you know, I, I just don't belong in this world with all these, all this tech. Oh no, Len, we're going to, we're going to pour salt on that wound. Uh, you got to wait, we got to pour some salt on it because then Paula, you and Diana, you guys, uh, we tested your microphones and Paula, how long did it take you to get your microphone up and running? Well, once I got all of the pieces, the, the equipment, Oh, that's right. That's right. You, you had to run down to, to like wherever, like two or three times. Exactly, exactly. So there were definitely some shipping delays, but once I actually had the equipment assembled, you know, two point four seconds. <laughs> and, and 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 was that before or after? Was Diana already ready by the time? I think Diana, you had your stuff around. Oh, it was but- like less than one second. I just couldn't believe how easy it was. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> There you go. That's the right hook we wanted right there. I, I hate to say it, but I'm, I'm, you know what? I, I'm, I'm trying to be humble when I claim that the reason is that Diana and I are both millennials. Right? We, <laughs> Absolutely. Which is to say that it's not our natural intellect that is to, you know, we take no credit for that as like, you know, in, in terms of talent or skill, we simply were products of an era where these things became more intuitive to us. I don't know. I will say this though. There was one person who was ready before the two of you today. And that was, uh, Ms. Humphrey was the first one ready today. So, uh, and, and Sharita, how long did it take us to, to, to get your uh, mic check done today? Oh, 10 seconds. Yeah. yeah, <laughs> Maybe. yeah. <laughs> so, so, but, <laughs> But how long did it take to get the app downloaded and get all of that? <laughs> we'll leave that on that. That's a whole, whole different thing. Yeah. But so, yeah. so Len and I give up, Len and I give up and uh, we decided to start again last week. And Len, we're trying to figure out your microphone situation and, and we just can't, we thought it was the earbuds. We thought it was Bluetooth. Like there was some reason your mic wasn't going. Right. And then, 
uh, the cord, there's a cord that goes in the bottom of your phone and you showed me what the damn problem was, which was that the cord was defective. You held yeah. the cord up and the cord kept popping right back out. Yeah. It just fell right. It, it, it was barely in Joe. And and that's how it was the week before too. I was like, yeah, God, some cord. It just, I mean, it was, I couldn't, it was amazing. Yeah. The thing was really loose. So Gertrude gets on this for us. And uh, we tell Gertrude, hey, Len's got this defective part to his phone. We've tried twice now for an hour, both times to get him up and running. We can't do it. So uh, Gertrude, uh, my mistake was Gertrude ordered you the wrong thing, but that's on me. And then we realized that it was the wrong piece. So then we get that figured out. And then Len, how it was maybe what, two hours later? Yep. Two hours later. So, so wait a minute. So we have... We have the three women here, Sharita, Paula, and Diana, who get this right. And then a woman comes and also saves your bacon two hours later. What yes. did what did the honeybee tell you? So I go to the honeybee and, and I say, Joe's getting me a new cord here uh, because, I mean, I, I was showing her my phone. I go, look at this. The thing is really loose. So what I did is I went to the honeybee's phone and um, I was trying to figure out what was going on because mine, it was loose on mine. Well, I plugged that connector into her phone and it was tight as could be. It was completely tight. I'm like, now what is going on? We have the same phone. And the honeybee says, well, she's looking at my phone. She goes, because you have a case over the phone and the case <laughs> is blocking the, the connector. <laughs> you idiot. So I take the I take the case off, and of course the the, the cord fits snug as a bug, <laughs> and that was the whole problem. And Paula, that's the engineer we've been working with for almost a decade, right there. I have so much confidence in our airplanes, <laughs> our engines, our roads and bridges, our water systems. Wow! Oh yeah. man. Yeah, I think that's a great way to uh, to leave it. We're back next week and even even uh, better than ever now that Len knows how to use the damn cord. <laughs> <That's> stupid. <laughs>